Hello everyone. We are recording today at the 6 hour Lone Star Le Mans at the Circuit of the Americas. Now, no one can deny the value of manufacturers in motorsport, especially with brands like Audi to Porsche, Ferrari. The sport wouldn't exist without these brand entities. And today we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into the world of manufacturers with Emily Rotkopf. Marketing representative to manufacturers at the World Endurance Championship. Welcome to the show, Emily. Thank you for having me, and welcome to one of the WEC race. Yes, I'm so excited. It's my first endurance race. Actually, I've never been to one before. Um, I've been to this track before. This is my third time here, but never to an endurance race. I hope you're ready because it's actually longer than all the races you might have done. <laughs> yes, it is. I was telling my my parents about it. They don't know anything about motorsport, so I was telling them that it's a six-hour race, and they were like, "How does that work?" I'm like, "I'll tell you. When I come back, I'll let you know. I'll let you know how that works." Um, but thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? How has it been? The weekend build-up. Honestly, it's been great. Like the weather is good. It's a bit too hot, but I just yeah. we're in America, the American style. Yeah. Let's see about it. As you know, we have like two big American brands, mm-hmm. so I think they're super happy that we're coming back to yeah. that race track. Yeah. Kota is also so famous yes. as a track, so let's see about it. And for now, everything is running pretty smoothly. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, absolutely love it. I know it's been four years, so very exciting. So obviously while I was doing research for this episode, I looked a little bit into your past experience and you're basically a sports badass. You worked <laughs> in football, basketball and now you're in motorsport. So what made you come to motorsport and what do you think is unique about working in motorsport? Yeah, that is true. Basically I grew up with sports in my entire family because My dad has been working into that industry since I'm young, so okay. he always took me like to football matches, basketball matches, and even to sports. A lot of sports, even like extreme sports, is mm-hmm. a bit more niche. And uh, then during COVID, I also started to dig a bit more into motorsport. I was just like, oh, this is actually interesting. It's so different mm-hmm. because it's not only about the person. It's about a brand. It's about a strategy. Yeah. It's about technology. It's about traveling a lot. And it's a mix of like having people working together and achieving something as a team, mm-hmm. and not only one person uh, achieving everything. Yep. And like you need to find the right balance between the technology, your strategy, the team you're having, the drivers, and bringing all of that into together. That's how you win a race. And if you don't have all those green lights at the yep. same time, you might end up like. Crash, views, yep. or even like something, and also turn it's up. dangerous. Yeah, yeah. super bad. Yeah. So, I think that's the entire like family spirit that I love, mm. and especially in the wake, like it's um, a big family. Like everyone is super close to one another. Everyone know one another. Like if you walk in the paddock, everyone is gonna say hi. Everyone is gonna speak mm. to you, and they're rivals on track. But once you're Behind that, everyone is actually friends. Yeah, everyone is having drinks together, and oh, I love that. Yeah, so it's super like, it's I would say it's a healthy environment, and that's also what I love about motorsport. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I think motorsport is so much more intense than people realize. When I started watching motorsport, I have a very cliche story: Netflix, Drive to Survive, Formula <laughs> One, and now here I am. But I don't think I really realized how physical the sport actually is. It's mentally taxing, physically taxing, but not just like you were saying for the drivers, but also the team. The teams are traveling so much that also it adds so much pressure. And then of course there is this rivalry. But I love what you said that there is a lot of camaraderie yeah. within all the teams. I also think I don't know if this is unique to WEC or not. I've been to a few other series, and I definitely think that I mean I've been here now only for a few hours, but I can already. Kind of sense a sense of what you were saying, like a family spirit yeah. and very welcoming um, compared to other sports that I've been to. That that's also what we're trying to keep at the WEC, as like you know the organization that organizing the event. We're a small company, mm-hmm. a small French company based in Paris, and we're not trying to extend our company to like a big industry where we end up being like 300 people and no one knows who we are. Yeah, we're actually like. 30 coming to all the races, yeah. so we know everyone. Everyone knows who we are. They come to the office, and it's yeah. actually like even easier for the team. They're not afraid like to send us callers or send us a WhatsApp mm-hmm. if they have any request, and 
that's how we want to keep it as a big family yeah. traveling all the world together. I love that. I think that's just such a nice environment to work in, especially because you're you're working you know, more than a regular person works. It's not a nine to five job. Yeah. You're working like 16, 18 hours a day sometimes. So coming sec- uh, specifically to WEC, now obviously it's no secret that WEC has many manufacturers. There's Alpine now, Lexus, Ford, Ferrari, all the big names. So for someone who does not have an understanding of how this world works, why do these manufacturers actually invest in WEC? And what is like the business or marketing case for them? I would say that is a very broad question. And as I was telling you earlier, we're actually launching a new mm-hmm. series called Meet the Legends. And it's going to be out in November yeah. on our YouTube and as well on our dedicated mm-hmm. website. Um, so we dig into each brand and we try to understand why they decided to come back mm-hmm. to the WEC um, precisely. So I cannot give you an answer that is correct for all of them. Yeah. Because if you have a discussion with each one of them, they're going to give you a different answer. Mm, so, interesting. for example, I would say that Ferrari, it's like in their DNA. Yes. They're yeah. like racist. They love building cars. They also have an history with Le Mans. Mm-hmm. It's starting yeah. like ages ago. Yeah. Um, so their interest by coming back to the work, it's more to like test, have like performance, endurance, and like to also bring that um into their racing DNA and to be present on a lot of different motorsport because they do competition at GT, Formula mm-hmm. One, work. So for them, I would say it's more like they need to be in a world championship yeah. because it's yeah. their DNA. There's this thing they always say that like all the other teams, all the other manufacturers, they race to sell cars, but Ferrari sells cars to race. Exactly. Which I think is so interesting. Yeah. Because for example, I was having a chat with them and like their cars, their order mm-hmm. for the next five years. So they don't need to come on track and have new yeah. clients and yeah. get their brands implemented in new market. Mm-hmm. It's not what they're there. Yeah. But if you take, for example, another example as Peugeot, mm-hmm. which is like a French brand, uh, even though they're present worldwide, mm-hmm. they're also here because they want to develop a technology in their racing mm-hmm. car. Yeah. And after that, they want to use that technology to put in their series car. And so they can sell a car that is affordable, yeah. Um, and that they can last for a long time because they manage to endure during the race mm-hmm. for six, eight or 24 hours. So true. And their objective by the end of that is to sell SCAR mm. and to come to a new market and to basically have a return on investment. So yeah, that, that is very different. Like, So it's a bit complicated. We have like 13 manufacturers now. So yeah. <laughs> if you I need know, to you're, hitting, all you're the, breaking all the records. Yeah. I find it really interesting because when I did not know anything about motorsport, I always assumed it's always the luxury manufacturers. But now I know there's other brands as well, like Ford. There's, there's so much history with Nissan. And I didn't realize that until very recently, um, that it's not just about the luxury car manufacturer. It's about all of them. And to your point, they all have different reasons of why they want to um, be in this space. But at the end of the day, there is a very real business or marketing case for them. Um, so like you were saying, some we WEC has broken so many records now in the number of manufacturers, especially with the introduction of Hypercar. Um, so I would love to know a little bit more about was this decision intentional to bring more manufacturers in or is there something the sport is doing actively to bring more manufacturers in? So I would say that once they decided to change their regulation in 2021, they were also facing an issue because like for the manufacturer to enter actually a world championship, Mm -hmm. there's actually a lot of money that needs to be invested. Mm -hmm. Right. So they decided to create a new category where the manufacturer can actually enter two different championships because the cars that are developed to participate into the work, they can also race into IMSA. Right. So Mm -hmm. basically they bring regulation that were much more easier for them to compete. And it was also great because as the regulation were a bit less complicated, the manufacturer could express their DNA into their racing car. If you go out in the paddock and if you look at all the cars, Mm -hmm. they all have their specific DNA inside Mm -hmm. of the car. Like Peugeot is having a special one and actually they have a, they like created that their EPA car based on one of their series car. Oh, wow. So that's based on them. Like, it's really, really different. Cadillac has a sound mm. that no one else have. Mm. Like, it's the American spirit yeah. <laughs> coming to the track. It's yeah. so bold and so unique. Um, and so, like, each of them, with that new regulation, 
were able to like develop themselves without breaking their strategy DNA. and their DNA. Yeah. So that's what one of the reasons. Yeah. But also at the WEC we try like to keep the number of races affordable for everyone. So like all the manufacturer can actually join without investing, for example, the money that Formula One requests. Yeah. Okay. So we only have eight races mm. and we also travel also for a sustainability reason from race to race with uh, boat freight instead of air freight. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, which keep the cost so low yeah. because compared, like one of the main costs when you're racing, of course, there's developing the car, mm -hmm. but also you have the freight that mm -hmm. is so expensive and like using the sea instead of the air yeah. is much more affordable for them. So Interesting. That, yeah. Oh, wow. Does it not take, obviously, a lot longer than though for to carry freight from one place to the other? So how do manufacturers plan? So I mean, I guess there's a lot more gap, though, in the races. So exactly. it is easier to plan ahead. And That's so interesting. They have, like, two sets of freight as, like, for other races. Mm. For Formula 1, they have four or five mm. traveling around the world. But with two sets, if you like organize it well, you can just have it from one race to another. Obviously, on some races, it's mandatory to use air freight, but the right. cost is much, much more affordable. Yeah. So, yeah. for example, Lexus is coming with um, to the right to mm -hmm. the WEC, and it was, for them, it was already a big investment, mm -hmm. but it was also much more affordable. That's why they, they were able to come back in the championship, and that's why we have yeah. such a big numbers. Yeah. And we have 13, because we can't have more garages. Yeah. So that was going to be a question I was going to ask you. It was like, now the manufacturers are increasing. Does that mean it puts more pressure on WEC to build more garages and bring you know, more logistics for them? In the end, we're not really the one deciding because there are mm -hmm. the tracks building garages. Yeah. And in some tracks, it's just not feasible to have. Right. And now we already have like 38 cars. Mm -hmm. So at some point, if you're accepting more manufacturer, it means more cars and we just can't afford to have them because we yeah. don't have space anymore. Yeah. yeah. So that's so interesting. So if WEC like, you know, obviously is more affordable, more accessible for manufacturers, do you think it creates a better case for them to invest in a WEC rather than rather than like an F one? Like just in terms of getting a return on their investment, a return of whatever they're looking looking for? I think it would depend it's also gonna be on a case by case basis mm -hmm. because it's also gonna depend on your result on track because if mm. you're not performing at the end the people are going to leave yeah. even though the marketing case can be a great one because in the end everyone is there to win yeah because yeah. you're there for the sports yeah so you need to find a good balance to like attract them with like affordable costs but also to having a lot of people on track and keep them entertaining finding new ideas on to show how they need to stay in the WEC because it's actually the place to be. Mm -hmm. And where we have a great case is that currently we have Formula One, mm -hmm. but it's not in terms of cost. It's just so complicated. Yes. And you don't really have brands associated. You, Of course, you have Mercedes and Ferrari, but all the others, they're not really like big brands represented in the yeah. championship. And like, yeah. yeah, because it's not competitive. So when anybody thinks of Formula One, you think of like McLaren, Mercedes... Ferrari, yeah. Red Bull. Red Bull, of course, is different because it's not a car manufacturer anyway. So you're right. Like I think it's it, it is it's a harder case for someone like a like a new um, like a new entity to enter Formula One because you won't be competitive most likely when you enter the space. And you also need a first investment that mm -hmm. is 10, 20, 30 times mm -hmm. higher, yeah. which like obviously for the brands. Now that we're getting a lot of like awareness and authority around the world, they're like also discussing that. And also one of the main thing is that the cars they are mm -hmm. creating as well, the hypercar, in the end, they can also replicate that for a series car and mm -hmm. actually sell it. That's what Ferrari did. Yeah, yeah. And for them, it's also a great case because when you're children and when you're young and when you're designing a car that you want, you're actually designing an hypercar yeah. and not a Formula One Very car. Very true, yeah. So for the car, they can write a long story about the brand, the marketing, which is much more like everyone knows. And the sport is also much more affordable. Yeah. If you want to come to a race and have literally access to everything, it's going to be 100 euro to come, for example, to Le Mans yes. for a week. Yeah. It's just like, so it also speaks to everyone, to larger family and to like all the um, 
social class. It's not only a top tier. Yes, yes. F one is becoming very unaffordable, and I say this very openly that I think they're pricing out fans, especially American fans, because American fans are not used to spending so much money on big sporting events. You can go to even if it's like um, I think now even U.S. Open is becoming more and more expensive. But if you look at like American football or basketball, the tickets are never that expensive. Um, so American fans are not used to spending like five, six hundred dollars, and that is, I'm being, I'm, this is like lesser than what it actually <laughs> yeah. is. Like Vegas is like fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, and so, you actually don't have access to the paddock. No, you're not going to the Great Walk. Mm -hmm. Nothing, and like that's also. I think why we have such a family spirit is like if you're coming to spa and you actually need to come yeah. there, everything is open. Yeah. Like if Which I think makes so much sense because if I have been to a race as a fan and the reality is unless you're in a very good grandstand seat with a, a um, like a camera or TV in front of you, you can't really keep up with the race. Um, so I love that all other series, like even Formula E does this really well, that they actually have a very open paddock setup, and you can actually see what's going on. Because otherwise, I'd rather sit on my couch and watch a race, because yes. then I can actually <laughs> see what's going on, yeah. um, and it's a lot easier. Yeah, so that's why we're trying to keep that, and also that's why I think the manufacturer, in terms of storytelling, mm. the work is actually a great place to be. Yeah. I love that the barrier for entry is definitely a little bit lower, because... There is a lot of conversation about, you know, is is it is it becoming a little bit too inaccessible now? But yeah. I love that WEC specifically, I think, especially because it's such a global sport. Again, it's not just based in one country. Of course, you're based in Paris. But it's, again, very global, going to tracks around the world, attracting all kinds of communities, but still so open and welcoming, which is great. I like what you said though right now about you obviously being in a in a unique position because you're also the mouthpiece for the manufacturers but you also want to make sure their interests are being met. So how do you balance that with WEC, you know, because that's of course where you work and that's the series um, you're working with but you also work with the different kinds of vendors and clients and manufacturers. So how do you balance that dynamic? I would say that you need to like understand them, speak a lot with them, understand what their, their interest each and one of them mm. and once you understand that then you can like align how you want to work with them throughout the season because obviously as we have like 13 of them each of them have different key markets right so on some races you will do your focus more on for example if you're in Italy mm -hmm. you're going to focus more on like Peugeot, Alpine, uh, Ferrari and all the brands that are actually a lot involved right uh, in those key markets once you go to the Middle East, for example, it's mm. a huge, huge market for BMW mm. and Toyota. Yeah. So on that, you also like adapt. And that is great that we have eight races because you can like work and do your focus a bit more different depending on their market. And then after that, you can align throughout the year and define with them an the entire plan. But yeah. I'm not going to lie, 13 is a lot of uh, <laughs> <laughs> manufacturer to take care about. So we're yeah. doing our best and... As long as you have open discussion, and as I was telling you, we're a big family, so we're very honest with one another. Yeah. And they're not afraid to tell us, like, we need that, we need that for the next season. Mm. You need to improve in there, there, and there. And we're doing, like, meeting really, really frequently with all of them, and mm. we're not afraid to speak with all of them in the same room mm. and giving us where we can improve and yeah. what, where they're happy about. So, yeah, I would say. Yeah. Is there any specific challenge you feel... In your, in your role working with so many, I mean, A, is that there's so many manufacturers, but also, I mean, I think it can be both fun, but also challenging because everybody has different interests and sometimes they can conflict, but sometimes they can work together. So I'm just curious, is there any challenges you feel like, you know, or one specific challenge that you think has come up the most for you I, in your role? I would say it's to also understand each and every culture hmm. because as they have like a different culture once you grow up in different countries mm. you're not used to the same stuff and then having that bringing to more countries when you're coming to another race and work to the racetrack and to find the balance between their culture my culture yeah. and and the racetrack it's just like finding the good balance on everyone being happy how to communicate and how to find the good words and the yeah. way to say it yeah I would say it's that and uh 
And also at the some point, we also need to find good reason for them to stay in the championship because mm. in the end, you only have one winner at the end of the yes. season. Yes, yes, of course. And yeah. <laughs> so you need to find good marketing option and mm. strategy for them to want to stay, even though they're not winning on track. Yeah. And it's yeah. hard to explain to so the top management after, yeah, we want to stay, we want to invest more money, but we're actually last. Yeah, yeah. In the championship. It's so. tough. It is tough. Because but like you said, there is only going to be one winner. And there's nothing you can do about it. At the end of the day, it's a sport. And that's just how it works. But yeah, it can be challenging, especially if you're, you know, in the bottom half to continue to justify that, that cost, that investment, and also that time. Because, you know, it, it's a very intense sport as well. You're traveling so much and also employing so many people. Um, I'm sure it can be challenging for manufacturers to continue to justify that. But... Um, what I actually really like about WEC, though, is that even with so many manufacturers, I think it still remained relatively competitive, um, especially if you compare it to other series. Um, like, I don't I don't always have the... Ra like, sometimes I'll try to be like, okay, I think this is the, you know, team I'm going to, you know, be rooting for. But it doesn't always actually go that way. It's not always as predictable, I think, as it is with other series, like F1, for example. But that's also what I was telling you at the beginning, why I love motorsport and especially in the mm. WEC. You need to have, of course, in F1 you have a strategy, but it's only two hours. Yeah. You only have one driver and one car. And you also know that the car is doing a lot. But in the WEC, as you have six hours, you have one second when you're just like, the exchange of the driver is yeah. not going well, yeah. then you're out. One driver can not feel good that day, mm. but you need to have all the time the three drivers mm -hmm. going into the car. And you also need to have that team spirit. Yeah. And if you don't have it, it can also be more challenging. And I think that's also why. And also the car and the technology with the car needs to last for, for 24 right. hours yeah. or six yes. or eight. And to have that and to find you don't know what can happen. Just a small, tiny piece of the car yes. can broke and then you're out of the race. Yeah. And no, that, it's incredible. It really is incredible. That yeah. was great, and I hope it's going to be the same this weekend. But even in Le Mans, we had like 10 different cars at the top until the last hours. No one knew who was going to win. Yes, exactly. And it was only like two seconds between Ferrari and Toyota, even after 24 hours of yeah. race. If you do that in other series, the car might have done like oh. 20 more laps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no way. <laughs> There's absolutely no way. Yeah, the technology itself is so intriguing because... If you contextualize it, even a road car, there's just it's just not even possible. It's not even a it's a thought that you think about. Okay, like at this speed with this technology, um, running for 24 hours is absolutely incredible. Yeah. And imagine the engineers need also mm. to be on form because when you do the tire change and all of that, so it's an entire system that needs to work for like 24 hours. Yeah. So yeah. even during six or eight. On my side, I'm not sure I will be able to be concentrate for eight hours straight. No, that's If I was no a, an, an engineer. <laughs> so yeah. um, that's all of that. And also that's why the manufacturer are happy to be in the way because no one knows who will win at yeah. the end of the season. Yeah, I love that. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for joining me today on the show. I feel like I learned so much about manufacturers that I did not know about. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have an excellent weekend. And... Um, I know it's going to be busy, busy for you, but I'm really excited. It's my first one, like I was saying. So. Great. Thank you very much for having me. And I was telling you, if you need a garage tour or any more in-depth explanation from one of the manufacturers, just pass by and the door is going to be open. Oh, my always. God. I will, I will take you up on that for sure. <laughs>